I will entertain a motion to waive reading of the minutes of the last meeting of the association. Motion? Do I hear a motion? Second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. Now I'll ask for our treasurer's report. Carolyn? Okay. Good afternoon. So we have $1,200 left in our operating account of uh, expenses account. So we've made it through the year. Yay. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank everybody for having the faith in us to you know, renew your membership, give donations. And I think we've had a pretty good year. So moving on to membership. Uh, let's see, we have um, a, before I get on to new members, we have a member who joined in September who's been able, was able to come all the way from Delaware to join us today, Regina Berry. So let's welcome to Regina. Thank you for coming. And our new members are, uh, let's see, the first is Peggy Robin. Is she here today? Okay, so Peggy is a website editor, publisher, BCC alum, and she heard about AOI from Judy Hubbard, our intrepid helper. <laughs> um, and, um, and then Joseph Prefontaine, and he lived and worked in D.C. for over 20 years. He's a retired architect. Heard about AOI from member Charles Robertson. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to our new members. And just in case I missed anybody, are there any, is there anyone who's new who would like to introduce themselves? Or a visitor? Visitors, guests? Yes, I'm Mark Lundhoff, and my guest with me today is Janet. And Janet's first, and Janet's already interested in joining us on that. Yeah. Wonderful, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. And Diane? Diane was instrumental in making the introductions with Derek to the AOI. So I think that's it. Anybody else? Okay. And Bill, did you want to present uh, just... Here I am over here. Bill, yes. The uh, colored AOI, did you want to say anything about... Um, Sherry, Sherry Sewell brought some. I know, I'm going to just, just to okay. connect the dots. If you all will remember last month, um, new member Sherry Sewell, who's sitting over here at the second table waving, she brought this beautiful certificate, um, actually a proclamation, um, related to her great-grandfather's signature. John Sewell is on that certificate from, help me out, 1914? 1915 for the Association of Oldest Inhabitants Colored, which was the parallel organization to AOI White, if you will, okay? So anyhow, Sherry's brought that in. Um, I've taken some pictures of it after last month. I put it on the website that we'd made this connection, but unfortunately I didn't make the connection as to what Sherry's uh, relationship was to John Sewell. Now I know she's his great granddaughter, so I can go back and correct the website and not just say her ancestor John Sewell. <laughs> so we'll make that correction. So again, be sure to you know stop by and look at the certificate. It's very impressive at the back of the room. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. I'm great regret that the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Usually I can make myself heard without a microphone. <laughs> People complain about that. Um, but now I can uh, calm down here. Uh, regrettably, our intrepid historian, 
Nelson Ryman Snyder is not here. He and Lisa, he and Lisa spend some time out in Tucson with their family. Um, at, of course, this is a beautiful time of year, but Tucson's pretty nice too. So in his place, our intrepid former president and board direct member of the board of directors, Bill Brown, will administer today's historic quiz and deliver the uh, highly prized uh, goodie bag that Nelson puts together. Okay, now I'll, I'll not try. Yes, Pat. Yes. And you forgot to introduce her. Deo Akinishe is with is Pat Tyson's guest today. Welcome. A um, Civil War United States Civil War Colored Troop Cadet Academy operated out of Marie Reed School. Right, he operated out of the school, right? Because I know that's where we went to the celebrations and the award ceremonies. And um, AOI for several years, we were too late in you know, getting together with Dexter and his efforts before he passed away, but for several years, AOI made contributions to that program for the cadets' uniforms and for their materials and all. So, so thank you, Pat, for, for speaking up and recognizing Dea. Okay, now I'm going to step into my Nelson Ryman Snyder role, and I'll try not to, uh, I'm not channeling him, and I'm not going to try to imitate him, but please recall that if you, this, and this is all self, you know, reporting, if you have won in the past, please refrain from, from uh, answering, and please don't shout out your answer. If you will raise your hand, you will be recognized from the lectern, okay? I said that a little bit nicer than Nelson would, I think. Okay, so here's the question. At the time, it came about with little notice in segregated Washington, D.C., dot, 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 Name the first lady credited with integrating the annual Easter egg roll at the White House. Hands. I only see one hand, so in the back. I'm going to guess Eleanor Roosevelt. No, I'm sorry. As they would say on Jeopardy, that is not the correct answer. <laughs> okay, now, now Larry, I th have you won in the pa Yeah, see, I remember. Yes, our, Mamie, Eisenhower. Mamie Eisenhower is correct. And what is your name, please? Clifton Jones. Okay, well, you get Nelson's goodie bag, which is full of Senate beer, um, memorabilia, and note cards of Rhodes Tavern. And I'll bring that right over to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Nelson. I mean, Bill. <laughs> um, and now we come to. Uh, an important time in the uh, course of the meeting. And I'd like to ask our uh, elections committee members to come up onto the platform because they will be the ones who will be announcing the candidates and will be conducting the election. So, election uh, committee members. Hello, I'm Walter Springman. I'd like to start by uh, thanking fellow committee members uh, Winfield Swanson and Judy Hubbard. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, there is a motion on the floor to accept the following slate of officers and board members for terms beginning immediately. Uh, Cindy Welly as president, John Edwards as vice president, Caroline Michelle as treasurer, Rick Marino as secretary, Nelson Ryman Snyder as historian, and Gary Scott as director. There are still. Oh, if you all would please stand up if I called your name, please. Right. Okay. And uh, there, there still are two vacancies on uh, for director if anyone is interested. But at this time, I'd like to call for a second for the motion. Second. Great. And at this time, we'd like to call for a voice vote. Eyes have it. Aye. Okay. The motion is carried. And at this time, I'd like to hand it over to the new president, Cindy Welly.
We need to get a gavel. Yes. Cindy, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And more. And, and, and many more. more. Thank you. Well, we, I, I thank you all, and, um, and I, we thank Tom, and I know we want to have a, a more formal thank you that's going to be coming up uh, in, the, in the future in February as well. I did not prepare a midterm acceptance speech for this, so I will make this extremely, extremely short for you. But thank you for putting trust in me to um, spearhead this organization. I don't think I am what uh, Benjamin Taylor had in mind in 1865 when he was creating this organization. I don't think maybe most most of us in this room or what he had in mind, um, but, uh, but I think we've got a lot of really fun, exciting programs coming up um, and a lot of ways to help our organization grow, and we are already growing and strong and adding members, so, um, so thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, but more importantly, I want to introduce our speaker today um, and introduce Derek Gray, uh, because that is most of what we are here for and interested in is, is the preservation and the expansion of DC history. Uh, so much that we have collectively in this room, uh, not only do we carry it with us, but we are able to learn and share as we learn and share uh, here in this room and at our luncheons. Derek is not quite ready to, to be a member um, in full standing of, of AOI. He's only been a DC, in DC for 15 years, so he's getting there. Um, but, we'll, but, but he's from New York, as many of us are transplanted, so we will we'll accept, him, accept him for that. Um, he is an archivist at the People's uh, Archives at the DC Public Library. Um, most of you, I think, for, for many years know it as the Washingtoniana Division of the DC Public Library. Library. Um, and if you haven't been up there to see the new uh, area that, that, and the new library and the renovations, um, get a chance. Go visit Derek and go up there and, and take a look and go see it because it's terrific. He became interested in this topic in his work as an archivist um, as people were coming into him um, and asking questions of him about the NAACP um, DC chapter. And that ignited what had already been an interest, a research interest and passion for him on African American history. Uh, one of his previous books is Angels of Deliverance, which is about the Underground Railroad in Queens, uh, New York. Uh, so you can, you can find that if, and talk to him about that if you're interested as well. Um, um, this is a product of three years worth of research, um, and uh, we, I'm going to give a plug for his next book, um, which is coming out of this research, as so much research does, um, as you get more and more into it, um, which is going to be on Neville Thomas, who was a teacher at Dunbar um, and also was a president of the NAACP in D.C. Um, for, for several years. I'm guessing that there may be some history here among AOI members as well um, that you might be able to, to use and people who know, know information about that. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Derek. Thank you, and, uh, and please, NAACP in DC. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Right. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> okay. And to let you know, it'll always be Washingtoniana to me. <laughs> always. I was not happy with the name changed, but anyway, <laughs> moving on. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, so thanks again. Um, just bear with me, I'm a little nervous. Um, but I'm happy to be here today. Um, so um, I wanna allow uh, plenty of time for some uh, Q and A. Um, so I have about 30 slides to get through. So um, we're gonna go through and um, hopefully have some discussion. Um, so let's, let's get going. Um, so I just, just to start, um, 
the uh, don't let the Ku Klux catch you napping, um, that's an actual uh, membership campaign slogan that was used in the 20s um, uh, because of the uh, 1925 and 1926 uh, Klan parades in DC that the branch um, fought to prevent. Um, there was um, a, an attempt um, that the branch actually did foil in 1922 when the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia chapters um, attempted to uh, come through D.C. Um, and um, the president or executive secretary of the branch at the time uh, somehow found out about um, that and um, actually worked with the D.C. police department uh, and they, they stopped that. Okay. So um, just stepping back just a little bit, um, just to put this all in some context in terms of uh, early DC civil rights history, um, the District of Columbia Voting Rights Act was passed in 1867. In 1869, black men um, integrated police and fire departments. And um, as you know, you might, of course you are familiar, with the lost laws um, in 1872 to 1873, these laws um, prohibited discrimination in restaurants, hotels, etc. cetera. Um, these became known as the lost laws um, because they were never repealed, but they were never enforced. Oh, and I'm sorry if I'm just, I'm kind of, I might be ju jumping around a little bit. Um, I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but um, the argument that I really make in the book, and I'll talk a little bit about today, is basically what was the organization going to be? What was the leadership going to be? Was this going to be a conservative organization? Was it going to be a militant radical organization. And what made the whole research experience interesting was the branch actually jockeys back and forth with that. And ultimately conservatism did, moderate conservatism did win out. Um, there was moments and periods where militancy within the branch attempted to surface, but that's what made it very interesting. Um, in terms of what, um, how the organization was going to um, operate and how it connects with the black communities of D.C. Um, okay. Oh, and, and um, what I argue in the book and talk about here is that the branch was always the leading organization, the major organization. Um, but I argue that it was never the most dominant because by the time you get to the 60s, it's almost like a sort of, almost like a rise and fall almost. By the time you get to the 60s, the other organizations, civil rights organizations, like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and CORE and SNCC, overtake the branch. Um, and the black power movement elevates its voice. Okay. Um, and also I want to um, talk about this a little bit because another thing that I found in my research was the women of the branch were particularly engaging in an internal battle within the organization. It was the, in terms of gender equality. You know, the, the leadership was um, mostly male uh, from 1912 to the 70s. There's only three female presidents. 
and that, that was really disappointing. And there were moments where the women of the branch really fought back against their own uh, leadership within the organization. So I'm mentioning this because almost to give a shout out to the women, uh, African American women who came before the branch. Um, the Colored Women's Clubs formed um, in 1895 to protest segre segregation. Um, in D.C., you had the Colored Women's League, um, founded by Mary Church Terrell and Anna Julia Cooper. Those right here on the right. Um, and the National Federation of African American Women um, organized. And they met in D.C. and um, had held several conferences at the 19th Street Baptist Church. Um, and of course, that came around the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision. And um, this is a cool photo. You get the top here. Um, the um, now, uh, the NACW women are at uh, Harper's Ferry, um, which is really, really, it's really cool. Okay, so the, um, before the NAACP came along, um, you had the Niagara Movement. Um, as you're familiar with, you know, of course, W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, um, the Niagara Movement came out of that uh, debate between Du Bois and, and, and Booker T. Washington. But unfortunately, um, and it was, I'm glad I found some resources, found some information, but the D.C involvement in the Niagara movement is a story that I think is um, not told well. Um, it did operate in many states, and, but it also operated in the District of Columbia. And a lot of the veterans of the Niagara movement um, were also mem would, would go on and become members and founders of uh, the NAACP. Um, several women uh, particularly Carrie Clifford, um, even before she came to D.C. from Ohio, um, organized and set up fundraising efforts um, in D.C. in 1908 and 1909 at Shiloh Baptist Church and Plymouth Congregational. And the lady on the right, all right, um, the name Charlotte Hershaw, uh, and her husband uh, was a member. Both of them were members of the uh, Niagara Movement, and they were both members of the NAACP. Lafayette Hershaw. So I'm just talking about the National NAACP, just real quick, and then we'll, we'll get more into the, into the branch. Um, but the um, organization came about um, after several race riots in the United States, the Atlanta race riot in 1906, and the Springfield, Illinois race riot in 1908. Um, African Americans and whites were um, in New York to um, establish the organization, but the uh, leadership was uh, mostly white progressive uh, liberals, white men. Um, I don't have a picture of them, but William Walling, Moorfield Story, Oswald Garrison Villard, or Villard Villard, um, who was um, William Lloyd Garrison's grandson, and John Milholland, who Mary Church Terrell uh, befriended. So, NAACP forms in New York. 
it got to a point where it was argued that New York was not D.C. Uh, <laughs> no, and I, but and I, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it was determined that the organization would need a presence in D.C. New York was a powerhouse, but D.C. was where I, ideas were debated in Congress, uh, laws were passed, so um, a branch was uh, needed in, in Washington. Um, so in March of 1912, several people, a group of people, organized uh, or met um, at Metropolitan AME. Uh, and they had nothing uh, to start. There were three temporary officers, there was no constitution, uh, no executive committee members. One was Mary Church Terrell. They met um, at the church um, along with the Bethel Literary and Hist Historical Association in March of 1912. And it, it was a, that was the strategy because um, that organization debated um, and discussed racial issues and progress and uplifting the race. So the folks in the, in, who, who organized um, decided that this was a way to increase membership. Um, Mary Church Terrell was a member, um, Kelly Miller, a dean of, um, at Howard University, mathematics professor, Carter G. Woodson, and uh, Archibald Grimke uh, were all members, and they were members of the, of the branch. There's no, um, I didn't find really when the organization met, um, it was March of 1912, but it was March 1st through the 19th that they met. Um, but they officially uh, organized, um, my research, March 20th, 1912, because it was such a productive meeting that they literally decided to um, hold elections the next day. Don't let me back up for a second. Um, and things went so well that several folks from who came down um, from New York um, actually stayed in D.C., like Joel Spingarn. Um, Dubois was supposed to come, but he um, couldn't make it due to illness. But Spingarn came down, and they were so overjoyed at what had happened in terms of this branch forming that they went to um, Howard, and basically, Springer had extended his stay in D.C. and went around and talked to folks um, to get people to sign up. Okay. So, I should have mentioned this before. <laughs> Sorry. So, in 1910, D.C. had 95,000 black residents, and 30% 30, 30 of the population. It was a large, thriving, economic, um, upper, uh, middle, upper class, middle class. Um, black educational powerhouses, M Street High School, Howard. So it was inevitable that you know, the, a, a, black, a branch would, would come to um, D.C. And, um, they were known as vigilance committees before they became branches. And Waldron, John Milton Waldron, quickly assumed control of the Washington Vigilance Committee. And he was the man. He was um, considered perfect uh, to serve as the first president um, of the branch. Um, he was pastor of Berrien Baptist in DC. Then he went down to Florida, and um, uh, engaged in civil rights down in Jacksonville. Um, he set up an insurance company. 
Uh, he led protests against uh, Jim Crow or segregation ordinances down there. Um, he was a member of the Niagara Movement. He was the treasurer, and that was a pretty powerful um, position because he could, you know, he could control the money. Um, and then he came back uh, and served as pastor of Shiloh Baptist. And he was also president of the Alley Improvement Association, which um, really fought to improve um, the conditions of black alley dwellers. And he ran that out of Shiloh. Um, and he was also um, president of it was first called the National it was first called the National Negro Political League, and it was a black Republican group. Um, and I'm, I'm mentioning this because th this this is important, as you'll see later. But Waldron supported at first Republicans, and he changed. He switched to the Democratic Party after um, he uh, wanted um, um, he wanted assurance from William Howard Taft for the protection of African Americans. And um, he uh, met with Taft and some officials at the convention, and they blew him off. So he got mad and endorsed um, the Democrats in the 1908 election, and then changed uh, changed um, the name of the uh, organization. So it, it was called, into, you know, it was billed as an independent organization, but it, it, it leaned toward the Democrats. So basically the branch was um, made of, of elite black Washington of, um, folks, uh, attorneys, educators, entrepreneurs, many were affiliated with Howard. Um, this gentleman here was just one of many. Uh, Benjamin Gr Griffith Brawley, who was um, a professor and a dean at, at Howard. Okay. So, uh, the branch did not, was not successful at first um, in DC. Um, first it was an all black branch um, and white Washingtonians simply did not connect to it. Um, there were very, 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 very few white members. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of those white members uh, were not native Washingtonians. Um, when uh, it was a Wendell Stafford, who was an associate justice of the D.C. Supreme Court, he was a prominent member, and he was at the meeting uh, at Metropolitan. Um, and Charles Edward Russell um, uh, was also a member, uh, but he was from Iowa. Um, but mostly. Um, it was the uh, the press um, that did not um, they did not publish the branch's work. They didn't um, engage actively in promoting the branch in D.C. Um, and you can see like news about the branch, like in the Washington Evening Star, was very interesting. Like you would the news about the branch would be tucked away in the deep in the newspaper under like I found like one crazy. Example, it was news about a branch meeting and in, yeah, it was in the middle and then one, the story above was a story about an African-American woman who had committed suicide in jail and then there was, a, below that was an uh, advertisement for hemorrhoid ointment. <laughs> so yeah, so it was like, okay. Um, but in terms of um, the black press, William Calvin Chase um, opposed the NAACP. Um, and a lot of it had to do with Du Bois. Uh, he didn't like him. He always thought that he was a firebrand. Um, he really was a firebrand. 
And at first, he thought that Dubois was being too academic in fighting for civil rights. You know, this, act, this thing between him and, the, and Booker T. Washington was, it was, you know, it was, you know he was a professor. Because um, I think there was one editorial that he wrote where he's like, you know, all he does is, you know, write books and stuff. Um, so, um, and a lot of it was also money. Um, the Crisis Magazine that um, Dubois edited um, was published in D.C. And basically it was, he just considered it an ac economic threat because um, it was the largest paper in D.C. So um, eventually um, Chase did come around and join the organization uh, and he became a supporter, but at first he was like, mm -mm. And he also said, and the Just Another Movement um, that's what he thought the NAACP was going to be. The Niagara Movement, the, there was another movement, I forget the name, but it, it was, it didn't last long, but Chase argued that it didn't last long because of the white and black racial unity. In reality, it, it fizzled out because of personality differences. But basically he was like, this black and white thing is just not going to work and here comes this new NAACP. It's not gonna work either in DC. Okay. So we get to um, Woodrow Wilson's 1912 presidential run. The NAACP, through Du Bois endorses Wilson. Um, it was a very interesting essay that he writes. He basically argues that um, uh, Taft and Roosevelt could not be forgiven for their treatment against African Americans with, uh, with Roosevelt, with what happened in Texas, in Brownsville, and uh, the horrible uh, record of lynchings under Taft's administration. And Du Bois thought that Wilson had, was presenting himself as a, a liberal southerner. Um, but basically the best of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Waldron was way more enthusiastic. Um, he had known um, Wilson when uh, Wilson ran for governor of New Jersey uh, back in 1910. Um, so he's, he uh, offered his services um, and was just, they, they met, um, and he, he was really all in uh, for him. So of course Wilson wins. And this is really kind of when Waldron's troubles begin. Um, as you know, of course, Wilson gets in the office and institutes federal segregation and segregation in the federal government. Um, people start to come to the branch for assistance, um, black workers. Waldron offers no assistance, really. And then he just started doing other things. He retained correspondence for the, the national office. He would use, misuse branch funds. He threatened to dominate the NAACP from D.C. He was really quite an arrogant guy. Um, so to, to the point where the branch was like, you know, dude, you're like, you, you're a good leader. Put down the shovel. You're, you're just digging. In fact, Carter G. Woodson wrote to him and said, like, calm down. Like, I will leave this organization if you don't chill. So Wilson, I mean, uh, Waldron, just, he just keeps on, you know, digging the, shop, digging the hole. So he gives a speech in Portsmouth at a um, Baptist convention and really just, you know, says, well, black folks need to learn how to learn to vote the right way and renounce the bugaboo of the Republican Party. But what really, really doomed him was the national office found out from Wilson's chief of staff 
that <laughs> Waldron had asked Wilson to appoint him recorder of deeds. And that was a no-no. So basically it was very apparent to the branch Waldron was using his position to get a political appointment. And it got, also got to a point where um, people were looking at Waldron as um, self-serving, you know, uh, the preacher politician, you know, the, these type of people who um, really are not looking out for the interests of, of the black community, only looking to serve themselves. So um, the national office comes down and they meet with them and say, you know, some things are going on and we need you to kind of cut it out um, and or face expulsion or, you know, you might um, be, you'll, you'll be removed. So he says, well, if I'll only be crucified by my own people, I'm not going anywhere. And on June 1913, he basically he was at Lincoln Temple Church. Um, there was a crazy meeting. Things got out of hand. They threatened violence. Uh, people at Lincoln um, were told, they told the meeting, you need to calm down. We're all going to be arrested for disorderly conduct. So they're in there for three hours. They oust him and they um, form their own um, branch. So you had the pro Waldron and the other group. And the opposition was led by Neville Thomas, my guy, um, who was a teacher at uh, Dunbar, um, and really a radical, really um, considered rad more radical than the other members, and Nanny Helen Burroughs. And also, since they were educators, another thing that kind of, they also did not care for Waldron because he had um, tried to do some things with the DC schools and he got into it with uh, uh, Roscoe uh, Conkling Bruce, yes. So they, so that's the summer of 1913. It goes back and forth. The national office tries to figure out what to do with Waldron, and they oust him. Um, so they figure, okay, now what, what are you going to do now? So Archibald Grimke um, is up in Boston, and he said, I'll never um, do anything with the DC branch just as, as long as it's being served by self servers like Dr. Waldron. Um, he had a much more easygoing personality, so a lot of people really liked him, uh, especially the national office folks. And they um, considered him for the position. Um, he had an impeccable resume. Um, he was in New York uh, founding the NAACP. He was up in Boston. He edited The Hub. It was a black Republican newspaper. Um, he had served as consul to Santo Domingo. He was an attorney. So he, 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 was, he was considered a good fit. So um, they appointed him interim branch president in September, uh, and he served um, from 1914 to 1925. So this is what I'm talking about with the whole confrontation versus not being confrontational. And this was like the first, um, the first uh, example. Um, Grimke worried that he needed an issue to galvanize the branch around. And Wilson provided that with the federal segregation. Um, so they held a big meeting uh, at Metropolitan AME Church to protest what they called the new slavery. Um, here Grimke is with, it's called the Committee of 40. Um, he organized um, speakers bureaus to go around the city to talk about the branch and its work. Um, he worked with the national office. Um, to, uh, so what, so people in the, the departments 
would secretly report out what was going on. They'd get it to Grimke, he'd get it to the national office, and then they'd get it into the crisis. So after a while, everybody knew what was going on in DC. It was published in newspapers, and basically everywhere except the South, there were harsh editorials about what was going on in DC and what Wilson was doing uh, and, his, and his cabinet officials were doing. Um, and one thing that's important about the branch is that they were fighting like a two-front war. Wilson and the cabinet, but also the Jim Crow legislation that was being passed in Congress. A lot of anti-interracial um, marriage bills, segregated streetcars. Um, Wilson's, the Congress during Wilson's administration were some of the most racially hostile. So they were looking out for black Washingtonians and then also African Americans nationally. Um, in terms of the uh, confrontational aspect, um, Grimke would march in to some of these hearings and just like, you know, this is wrong and uh, get into big debates. Uh, with these um, pro-segregationist um, folks who are pushing these um, uh, pushing these bills, um, oh, and then he um, also um, it didn't happen. But again, going back to the whole confrontation, he was like, well, it, he met with um, some of the national officers and told them that he wanted to take about 30, uh, 30 black post office employees, bring them to the White House, and let them sit down and talk to Wilson about what was going on because he argued like it's one thing for Wilson to be reading all these letters from civil rights leaders. It's another for the people who are experiencing this to um, talk to the president. And Grimke's attitude was, if Wilson could meet with a delegation of white suffragists, he can meet with um, black people. Okay. So, I mean, there's a lot more of the, you know, um, things that happened in, you know, the teens in the book, but I'm just hitting the highlights. So. This example was more of, again, non-direct activism or militancy. So the birth of a nation comes to Washington in February of 1916 um, at the, new Nas at the national, new national Theater. Other branches went around and got scenes deleted or got the film banned outright. This was an example where um, Grimke was, he wanted to be cautious and not confrontational. There were, they had a, uh, um, they held a meeting, they devoted one meeting, to, uh, several meetings, um, to what to do about Birth of a Nation, how to get it st uh, stopped. And there were um, some members who were chemists and they said, well, if it shows in DC, wherever it shows, detonate the building, <laughs> blow it up. And Grimby was like, well, I'm doing that. Um, but the Washington Afro-American and the Baltimore African-American, they, they endorsed it. Um, so um, even with that rejection, then there were calls, okay, well, let's go to the National Theater and protest in front. Let's go to the, uh, the district building and protest against the commissioners because they had the power to stop it. Um, and Grimke said no. And that's where it's this whole thing of, well, and this goes on in later years, but that type of activism to these members, it's, this is the rowdy element. We're not rowdy. We're, we'll fight it in the courts and be cautious and that kind of a thing. Okay. 
So um, Carter G. Woodson was one of the most um, vocal supporters of more militancy within the branch. And this also came about after the 1919 Red Summer riot in DC where black people fought back. And the branch, Neville Thomas was, he was in the crowd um, encouraging people to fight back. Um, I talk about this in the book, of course. Um, fortunately, not here. Um, but that's where that, that militancy percolated, um, but it never really surfaced. But Woodson said, get the support of all the colored businessmen in the city and use their stores as a militant center. That's what he wanted the organization to be, where Grimke thought that that would alienate um, whites in D.C. And Woodson was like, well, who cares? <laughs> um, but going into the 20s, that was where, and you'll, I'll talk about it later, where Thomas picks up on that, that call uh, for that militancy. Um, so by the time you get to 1919, the branch was successful in um, integrating some federal departments. Um, and they prevented all of the Jim Crow legislation passed. Uh, all of the, the segregated streetcars, the marriage bills, there were like back to Africa um, bills. All that was defeated um, by the branch. But, um, you know, at the same time, um, Wilson's segregation um, uh, did not end. So um, Neville Thomas um, it becomes president in 1925 to 1930, but this is where I was when I at the beginning of the presentation when I was talking about how women had to take an active role. Um, these two examples was the um, silent anti-lynching parade and the Mammy Monument. Um, the national office had um, organized a lynching committee after the murder of Jesse Washington in 1916 in Waco, and the branch adopted one in 1918 um, after the brutal murder of a woman named Mary Turner in Georgia who was killed when she, her husband was lynched and she threatened to identify the lynchers, um, and they uh, murdered her. Um, but the um, uh, anti-lynching crusades had, um, were as early as 1917, but there was a silent parade uh, in June. Um, meetings were held at Metropolitan, and the women of the branch took control of it because before that, in May of 1922, the Lincoln Memorial what had been um, dedicated um, in, in a segregated ceremony. And the branch, there were calls for the branch to try to get, um, what's his name? Cheryl, Clarence Cheryl, uh, fired. But he worked in the Harding administration. And the branch's attitude was, well, we need the Harding administration to pass Anti pass, uh, get the uh, anti-lynching bill passed, if we try to get Cheryl ousted, that will alienate Harding. So the male leadership was like, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't do that. Um, so the women stepped up and um, um, led this um, march. The Mammy Monument was an even larger example. Um, so John Sharp Williams in the coat that looks really too big um, for him <laughs> um, it introduced a bill uh, to erect a Mammy Monument in DC. Um, it was met quickly with opposition uh, from the women um, in the city, but particularly the uh, branch 
because Shelby Davidson, um, who was the executive secretary of the branch, wrote to James Weldon Johnson saying, basically, we're not going to protest this. Even Johnson had said that basically he had no problem with it being built, but he wanted it built in the South. But if it had to be built, then so be it. But they, they honestly thought that they were defending black womanhood. And Terrell and Burroughs and um, the Phyllis YWCA, they were like, no, 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 no. We're not going to stand for this. They wrote uh, editorials. Um, Terrell wrote for it to be uh, detonated by an act of God. Uh, uh, another, um, they, the women worked with uh, the Washington Eagle to pr um, write another editorial saying that um, they would detonate it, detonate it um, if, it, if it was built. They put a bomb underneath it. Um, so it, it, really, um, it really stirred up um, a lot of emotion and it really embarrassed um, the, ma the, the male leadership of the, of the branch. Um, and they also um, got so many resolutions and petitions um, together that they marched up to the Capitol and um, went to Vice President Calvin Coolidge's office with these and said, you know, we're against this. And it was never a bill. It, the bill failed in Congress. So 1925 to 1930, um, Thomas becomes president. Um, Kelly Miller calls him often in his column in the Afro-American, the John Brown of the District of Columbia. Um, one thing that I did find that was very interesting was um, Thomas's one of his biggest first fights was against the um, Carnegie Library. Um, there were no African-American librarians until 1943. Um, and Thomas really had a problem with that. So he wrote a lot of letters to um, George Bowerman, the library director at the time. And I found this correspondence in the DC Public Library archives and also some of the Washington Eagle um, newspaper articles. The mainstream black press and the white press ignored Thomas with this, basically, um, and also the branch actually fought back against him on it. Um, their argument was, well, um, the library is integrated, and that's good enough. And Thomas was like, no, you need black staff, black workers. So it was kind of like, um, it didn't, like a, it, maybe a, it lasted for about a week or so in the press, um, but that was one thing that he lost. But he was, it showed he was willing to go where even some of the um, branch members were not. But he did some other things. Um, he ended segregation at the Pension Bureau. Um, Again, when I was talking about the women, Charlotte Hershaw from the Niagara Movement, um, her husband, Lafayette Hershaw, Thomas ousted him because he was, he was, to, he was, he was at one, one of these departments, um, federal government departments, and he didn't get behind the Jim Crow uh, fight. And uh, Thomas just got rid of him. He's like, we don't need people <laughs> like that in this group. Um, he led, led very aggressive efforts to stop the Klan parades in both in 1925 and 26. Um, and he also uh, wrote to uh, President Coolidge to nominate um, the first black man to be board, on the board of commissioners, something that Grimke did not do, uh, that Thomas asked him to do um, a lot. So with the 1930s, um, 
police brutality um, and lynching were the main focuses um, that I found. At first, um, initially, uh, it was black employment in law enforcement. Um, Emma Frances Grayson Merritt, she took over after Thomas died in 1930 and was the first uh, female president of the branch. Um, and her argument was that she was, um, that uh, there would be less uh, police shootings um, if there were more black officers um, on the force. Now, I apologize, the images are very blurry. But Virginia McGuire is right there on the right. And she continued that crusade uh, even um, more aggressively um, than Merritt did, um, both on police brutality and lynching, but particularly um, concerning police violence against black women in the 30s, you see a, a very sharp increase in that. Um, I forgot the name of the book, but there's a good book on Mary Elizabeth Murphy's book on, 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 on um, uh, black women in, the, uh, in DC uh, is a good resource for that. Um, but one of the main, one of the interesting things that she did do, um, she led what was called the rope protests. Um, there was a big co uh, crime conference in DC to discuss the issue of lynching. And they excluded lynching from the, um, from the conference, and she had a number of people, uh, teachers, lawyers, journalists, but also college students, um, go and she got them pieces of hemp to wear around their neck to really provide that visual image um, and signs, um, talking about how black uh, victims of lynching were also um, black women um, and told them to stand outside the crime conference so people can see they were and she got the media involved so it was very very um, instrumental in trying to turn the tide of public opinion in favor of, of the Senate's Acosta and Wagner anti-lynching bill which was um, flowing through Congress at the time um, she worked with uh, the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, to pressure FDR. He was very reluctant to get it passed, um, but she invited um, Eleanor Roosevelt to, um, they held a lot of meetings at Metropolitan um, uh, to uh, get that passed. So she was president, but the executive committee, um, she was bumping up against uh, them, and they were a little bit more conservative. So she resigned after about two years, which she got a lot done in those two years. But she resigned, and um, the supervising principal of schools, John Bruce, gets elected and steers the branch in a more conservative um, direction. And this is where other groups start to take over in terms of activism in the city. Um, the New Negro Alliance was a grassroots organization um, that tried to, um, that um, went through economic activism. Um, so they led the People's Drug Store um, protests. And again, and, and the 30s is where this whole like rowdy element within the branch really circulates even more. Where um, the NNNA, they were like, yeah, let's get out in the streets and do this. And again, the branch was like, you know, more old fashioned, more traditional, um, you know, the courts, that type of a thing. You know, we don't, we don't um, engage, we don't do direct picketing and, and demonstrations. So 
For two years in DC, there was no DC NAACP. Um, again, um, how, what direction the branch should go. There were people who started to be become very disillusioned with Bruce's conservative leadership, the more progressives. Um, they all held a, uh, an election and they split and it just really got crazy uh, to the point where the national office got involved and they just revoked uh, the charter. So for two years, there was no uh, branch. And this is a 1939 letter from Walter White when it was all fixed, saying, come on back, things are better. Uh, there's a net lady here named Daisy Lampkin. They, she worked out of Philadelphia. She was a prolific fundraiser and a big um, high-ranking official. Um, she often came down and would help out with uh, operations with the DC branch. But again, two years is a long time. So that gave the, the National Negro Alliance and some of these other groups, they worked together with the Communist Party to fill that vacuum. And that's what was so hurting about the branch's um, dissolution. Because again, these were, for the long time, since the 1912, the branch was the leading major organization. So they're filling the void um, and they, they just do their thing. Um, they take over the police brutality and the lynching um, crusades um, and it kind of just takes away from, um, takes away from the branch. Um, and then the branch's return was very gradual. Uh, right around the time that they came back, um, you know, you had the issue with Marian Anderson uh, and the DAR controversy and all the branch could do was tell people to join what was called the Marian Anderson's Justice Committee. I think it's not, it, it's something else, but it, it was a committee to try to help her um, to sing at the um, Lincoln Memorial. And um, even Walter White, um, he urged the branch, well, get involved. Um, you know, hit the DAR with, um, you know, go after them as a, a you know, try to get them, with, he tried a, a, a lawsuit. Um, and um, the president at the time, a guy, a physician named Hen Herbert Marshall, said, no, no, we, we don't want to, uh, you know, we're just getting back and, you know, that kind of a thing. And, you know, so um, it was, you know, just very disappointing. But that became Marshall's, um, goal uh, going into the 40s, like basically just getting the branch back to, to that, to its glory. Okay. So I don't have, I only have two slides on the 50s and 60s because there's really a lot um, in there, but the highlight of the 50s was a major, major police discrimination suit uh, against the Metropolitan Police Department by the branch. Um, a lot of officials worked on it. Um, Julius Hobson was involved in it. Um, but the 50s is the last, what was the last decade um, of being on top, if you will, before it begins to decline again um, due to the Black Power Movement um, in the 60s and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and so forth. Um, the, that was, not, um, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. But King coming to DC in December of 1956, um, he placed a spotlight on the branch. He, go, he went to Howard and spoke, and then he ended the evening um, at a branch meeting at Vermont Avenue Baptist. Um, 
the branch was also involved with him being um, at the prayer pilgrimage for freedom. Um, they coordinated uh, all the uh, local um, uh, logistics. Um, interestingly enough, the branch, the, the national office did muzzle the branch a little bit. They did not put one speaker on the program from the branch. The only person from D.C. who spoke was um, President Mordecai Johnson, um, who did come to branch meetings a lot and did speak a lot. Um, but Nanny Helen Burroughs was not there. The, they planned a lot of the prayer pilgrimage at branch headquarters and at um, Metropol Metropolitan Baptist. Um, but um, um, so that was the case. So, oh, so, um, so the, the police brutality suit and the implementation of Brown versus, Brown versus Board, that was, those were the two main um, events or uh, issues that the branch worked on in the 50s. Now, the, um, the branch did lose that suit. Um, the the um, district commissioners found that um, you know, the, the uh, department was not um, uh, committing police violence, and they exonerated um, the chief at the time. But that suit did bring about some changes um, in um, in the department, in terms of black hiring and um, like blacks and whites officers would ride together, so minimal changes. Um, some were pleased with it, but Hobson was not. In fact, Hobson left the branch, went to the Congress of Racial Equality in the '60s, and then got kicked out and went and founded the Association of Community Teams. So he was one of the very few um, prominent Washingtonians who literally went from like three or four different civil, civil rights organizations. And um, there we have his letters, his, uh, his collection uh, at the People's Archive at the library. And in them you can really, um, there's a lot of uh, correspondence in there where he really, really like lays into the branch and says, you know, it, it's just too, um, it's just it's too traditional um, and it's um, too conservative. And um, that really comes out in the '60s. Um, the branch and core really go at it. Um, the black press um, dubs the branch as the listless DC NAACP. Um, so it, um, so what I argue is that the branch for a very long time was responsible for dismantling that legal segregation, knocking down those walls from 1912 to the 50s. Um, but again, in the 60s, you have more of political and economic inequality, not, not the, the Jim Crow laws and so forth. So that, that was where, uh, like the Black United Front, which is this picture here, with Stokely Carmichael and Fawn Troy, the branch. Yeah, Fawn Troy's here. Yeah, Stokely Carmichael. I uh, can't remember who was next to him, but uh, Chuck Stone um, is there. And um, they, they were like, the branch was like, no, we're not joining them, um, and, and so forth. So, um, and uh, I don't know, I lost my train of thought. But, but that, that, that was the... Um, the reason why um, there was that, that decline, the, the appetite was just for, you know, black power radicals like Hobson and Marion Barry. Um, the branch did um, 
endorse the free DC movement at first in the 60s, but then they backed out because Barry was calling for more, um, more aggressive um, uh, leadership. Um, and, and then when you get to the, uh, so I end it right at home rule. So by this point, it's Washingtonians want political power um, over traditional civil rights activism. So I'm going to end it here. Um, it's my contact information, and I really would like to open it up for questions. Yeah. Sort of a question and a comment. It seems so obvious, and I'm surprised that you didn't even touch on it until just your last sentence. So. Uh, that this, the DC um, branch, unlike every other one in the country, was in a jurisdiction where there were no political rights and no political powers, and we were totally under the subjugation of the federal government. And it, it's got to have, have had a, an immense impact on what people could do, how they could express anything. They had no elected officials. They were going to everybody else's congressman on the Hill to keep them from screwing them, much less everybody else in the country. And, that there's just a whole underlay with them, how we're so different that starts explaining a lot of the things that you're talking about, about people not being uh, bold enough and, 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 and being a little, you know, they're subservient because we were still on the plantation. I mean, and it, and it didn't matter who it was. And I'm just surprised that you didn't talk about that whole background and how it's different from the rest of the country and how the NAACP developed. Yeah. Oh, and LICO. Yeah, um, you're right. Um, but in the interest of time, I was, it, it's a lot to condense. Um, but th yes, I do agree with you. And that is something that I get um, a lot into in the, in the book, um, where the, um, House District of Columbia Committee and the Senate District of Columbia Committee, the branch really does engage in um, aggressive fights um, against those folks. Um, John, John McMillan, Harry Byrd. Um, but they weren't our co-guys. They were yeah. elected by somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, did I answer your... Yeah, I, I, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Lois West. Oh, Mr. Gray, I'm interested for future writers. If we're looking for district material, how does your collection at the library differ from what the DC History Center has collected on under their rubric? How, how are those two collections complementary or not? Yeah, yeah, they're they're very similar. Um, the mission statement is very similar. The co collection statement is very similar, and the policy is very similar. Um, I would say we well, give a plug for us, <laughs> um, but um, those two are the major um, repositories for for the local Washington D.C. history. Um, we're just larger, um, but I will say that one thing that I enjoyed about working on the book was the, uh, the ability to, when the, the need, also to go to um, so many different um, repositories in the city. 
um, like a lot of the background work, um, background story for the book, I found in a lot of collections at the library, but the DC History Center uh, had material as well. The Library of Congress, of course, has the NAACP papers. And, and I'm getting there, I'm getting there. No, no, and also Howard, because what was unique about Howard is that for some reason, there's a huge batch of DC NAACP records there. And then also some of the personal papers of the presidents are there too. Like one thing about Thomas that was frustrating, he, there's no personal papers collection that I know about, so I had to go to other, other personal papers of other leaders to find out stuff about him. Like, like there's a lot of, since he didn't get along with Dubois at all, they hated each other. There's a lot of Thomas stuff, for example, in the Dubois papers. But to answer your question, um, DC History Center and the uh, People's Archive are, are very similar. Derek, just one comment. Um, the, um, one of the problems that all organizations coming into DC had always had, be it the NAACP or any others, is that in the African American community here, mm -hmm. there was always an independence mm -hmm. and an intellect which suggested that, well, do we really need you? And I take a point, I always like to refer reference the uh, Thompson's Restaurant case. First of all, historic DC folks had a problem because, believe it or not, segregation and public accommodations were outlawed in DC in the mid 1870s, period. Uh, that's why a lot of generational DC people did not find it necessary to participate in Brown they said, let's just enforce the law that's on the books. And that was, which gave us the Thompson's Restaurant decision. Uh, it was not an action to desegregate. It was a mm -hmm. mandamus action to get the city to enforce the laws that were on the book. So that has mm -hmm. always been a major uh, problem in dealing with mm -hmm. uh, organizations coming into D.C. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And that was former director Carl Cole for the record. Please introduce yourself for the record when you ask a question. And this is, and Cindy, will this be about the last question? Exactly. I'm sorry. I'll just try to get back to you. Hi. My name's Tony White Richardson. I'm a member. Um, I'm many, many, many generations Washingtonian. I see another one of my many generations Washingtonian friends over there, the Quanders. And one thing the gentleman said in the back, what's his name again? He kind of summed it up. If you remember historically, he said the federal government didn't get segregated until when? Wilson. Wilson. I mean, black folks were already working here in the federal government. So a federal government job was always better than being a maid in somebody's house. So you were dealing with what we said here was a class system. A class system beyond the white folks' class system. Black folks had a class system. And so you had to deal with the intellectual aspect and he was talking about collections, and I worked at the library too, so FYI. You're going to get most of your prominent, important papers, the majority of them, for black people, you're going to find at Howard. Because don't forget, the library may have let us come, but they didn't let us work until the 40s. So where do you think black people were taking their papers? Howard University. Okay? Because nobody wanted them before. If you ain't going to let us work there, you don't want to read about us. So that is the thing that was going on. So if you really want to get a real feel, that's been gone mauling up at Howard University is where you go. Of course, Library of Congress got stuff as a result of. I tell people I don't know what the result of is sometimes. But when you said plantation, it kind of hit me. Because believe me, before there was this full integration, Black folks in D.C. didn't even think about being on a plantation. They were up, we were up in a whole other element, and this comes from my great-grandparents who were born and raised here, of being able to go to school. You forgot minor, you know, which is now UDC. We had these schools that when you went to New York, if you go to New York, there's no HBCUs. And they let us in in very minuscule numbers. So the, the girth of, of, of academic excellence and intellectual was here, in Washington, so he's right. We were like, ah, we're not too sure. <laughs> Who are you, where you coming from, 
show us who you are and we might let you play. And then when you talk about the different people that he showed, I understood and I want to throw this about Grimke. If you know the history about Grimke, I could tell he would have to be not too sure because you know my, my great aunts are the ones who freed me and they're white. So his, so his going after him would always be, you know, well, I got him. He was on a tender spot, you know. But all of that exists in reference to the NAACP. It's always been controversial. You know, we always say Thurgood Marshall wanted to go to University of Maryland, law school. They wouldn't let him in. He said, I had to go to Howard. You know, he's mad about that. But he was mad enough that it fueled him that it made him the best, one of the best lawyers in this country. And then he went back and sued the University of Maryland for not letting him in. Sometimes it's the fire that underneath, that's underneath of you that makes you perform to a level you never thought you could get to. Yeah, what? No, it, it, no, not, it was not. No. I, I think on that note, uh, I'm, I'm going to one more time, I'm going to thank Derek with a swag bag from ALI that, that we come by. Thank you. And also to make another plug for, for your book. So if you want to get, this is the first and only um, full length study of the NAACP uh, DC chapter. Uh, and that is going to be available with Melissa in the back, you can buy it. I'm gonna guess Derek is gonna be okay to sign it uh, for you in the back um, to be able to get it and maybe answer any other questions you might have while he's back there. So thank you. Thank you so much and uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And we will, we will see you all in January, hopefully at our uh, regular holiday, New Year's Day uh, uh, social. Uh, and then back again in February. So look in your mailboxes, look in your emails uh, for more information as it's coming. Thank you. Thank you.